Muy buenos días eh, eh, a quienes estén en... Good morning to those who are in Mexico City. Estamos aquí. And for those who are here in this hemisphere, I am Benjamin Mayer. Welcome, everyone. For those who are watching us uh, live and for those who are watching the repetition of this event we're now starting, eugenics, uh, legacies in Mexico and the Americas. I am Benjamin Mayer. I'm the director of 17 Institute of Critical Studies. And I am here with Susan and Tevi from the University of Toronto. She uh, promoted this uh, proposal and we are happy to, to make it happen, to make this proposal happen after preparing it with so much interest and passion. So thank you beforehand, Susan. So I'm really happy to uh, share that we have been collaborating with Susan and Tevi since 2013. We have had a, an important dialogue. So this event is within a wider framework of dialogues, events, and exchanges. We are particularly happy to, to display publicly this, this event about eugenics. We find this uh, event or this topic uh, important. I think that frequently uh, we tend to believe that it has more to do with the history and that has nothing to do with the present, which is, of course, not the case. But we hope that with our participation as an institute, we can make uh, a resonance about this subject, not just in Mexico, but in the, uh, but in Latin America. We are involved and we are implied in all of the problems that we're going to talk about throughout the, throughout these two days in the southern uh, cone, as we usually call it. And of course, because of many situations associated with public policies in terms of health, education, and other uh, areas besides the technological development and the technology uh, in our lives. So there are a series of criteria linked with uh, perspectives that are related to eugenics in an implicit or more explicit way. So I believe that it's important to make this visible in a more public way. In Spanish, the public presence of this subject is relatively limited. So that's why we are happy to collaborate and uh, well, put this on the on the map. So we would like to uh, welcome all the production team who has uh, worked in the preparation of this event. Also, to thank the participants who are here, and of course, uh, Susan and Tevi. and all those who are involved in Canada to make this event possible under the circumstance of uh, collaboration. So I will now, uh, well, I was just, uh, I just wanted to, to thank all of you. And now I will give floor to the introduction and general presentation of Susan and then the first uh, working panel. So welcome. Go ahead, Susan. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us at the beginning of our uh, colloquium, Eugenic Legacies in Mexico and the Americas. I'm Susan Antevi. I'm Associate Professor of the University of Toronto. And for me, it's a pleasure to start this event and having the opportunity of uh, collaborating with my colleagues in 17 Institute of Critical Studies. 
and also being able to share works, research, and collaborations, as well as presentations of this group of scholars uh, from different countries, including Mexico, but other countries of America and Europe who are going to be with us today and tomorrow. So before talking a little more about the project and the subject, I would like to specifically thank some people and institutions. First of all, the Board of Research of Social Sciences and Humanities of Canada, the Humanities Research Council of Canada. Thanks for supporting this uh, project. I will also want to thank uh, Benjamin Mayer Fuchs, uh, director of 17 Institute, and Beatriz Miranda, of course, uh, with whom we've been collaborating. She's director of uh, the, uh, the area of disability research in 17 Institute. And also want to thank all the technical team of 17 who, uh, who, who helped us with this uh, colloquium in the, well, now that we're in the middle of a pandemic where everything uh, is now virtual. I want to thank Alejandro Soy for, for his editorial support and especially Salvador Alanis for all of his technical uh, support on the audiovisual uh, preparation of the materials. And uh, Teani Eliera, and my yearly signs for all their communication coordination and help. So to put us in context, I want to tell you that this project started from uh, a network, a transnational network of researchers from the, the University College in London, in the UK, thanks to the initiative of Benedict Ipgrade from the College of London, he created along with his colleagues the project from small beginnings. That is a space for, a transnational space for reflection that brings together scholars, researchers, activists from different parts of the world that uh, work uh, uh, eugenics as a historical concept, but also, as Benjamin mentioned, as a subject that still has uh, its repercussions on our lives nowadays in different parts of the world. So this event, along with other events, uh, virtual expositions, uh, and congresses around the world, is, is planned to... Uh, to, to to be at the same time or to happen at the same time to the anti-century, anti uh, it's a, a museum and natural history in, in, in New York. They are conducting a series of events. So we are planning or we plan to have a space for reflecting and a critical space to talk about the subject uh, in its different uh, variations. So I invite you to check the web page from smallbeginnings.org to check out all the events uh, that are happening at Japan, India, different parts of Europe, Canada, United States, and, and Mexico, of course. So from a certain point of view, we can think that University College of London is somehow the starting place of eugenics, so to speak, because that's when uh, Francis Galton and this eugenics uh, scientists had their first labs and they worked with other specialists in areas such as biometrics, uh, genetics, biometrics, in order to measure and study human groups and populations. This idea of eugenics or having good origins, uh, it's related, generally speaking, with the notion of improving the population or improving humans with very direct interventions on the population in terms of reproduction, what it's called uh, hard eugenics, through sterilizations or even cases of genocide. Although, uh, more generally speaking, we could say that it's a matter of establishing 
uh, human hierarchy. So this is a racist concept and elitist concept that wants to distinguish and uh, and divide in order to decide who are supposed to exist in the future and the ones who shouldn't. Although this notion, this extremist notion of eugenics is not the only one that uh, we know about, uh, many countries, including Mexico and other countries in Latin America, we know that this uh, concept still exists. There have been different uh, branches of eugenics in many ways, as complex and fascinating as we are going to uh, learn in the following day. So I think it's a very important subject in terms of science. It has an important trajectory in the context, in the Mexican context, but and of course in other countries in Latin America, and I also believe it's an an important area related to disability studies. So the studies of eugenics give us uh, the opportunity of creating a trans uh, um, transdisciplinary uh, dialogue to understand how we study. Uh, I don't know, maybe reproduction health. So obviously eugenics is important for studies of disability and for populations with disability. If we think about their history and the way uh, eugenic practices uh, have been selecting and eliminating certain groups like those were like those who suffer disabilities. So this is a particular, this has a particular history if we think about uh, Shoah or the Holocaust, the elimination of people with disability in the program called T4 is studied by David Nature Snyder was uh, before or happened before uh, the uh, genocide of uh, huge populations of Europe. So we want to find the, the link of uh, between disability, race, eugenics. So thinking about this subject on the Mexican context, there is a big field or the big area, although the, the level of genocide is different. Uh, it, it appears, it is present, and I think it's important to, to find a way of understanding and make a link between disability and race. What are the differences between uh, race, like in different contexts, like uh, education or public life, and how race comes into play that sometimes is so ambiguous. Uh, on the other hand, it, it makes us wonder uh, what does it really mean to improve uh, in terms of health? Sometimes with good intentions, we could say, and yet uh, eugenics is uh, present. Or maybe we could wonder like what uh, would be one for the future uh, as a national project or what's the image that we have of this uh, future or what does it mean to have a, a well-being or, or 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 a future? And in terms of uh, from an academic point of view, like who are going to be welcome in these uh, conversations? So we're sort of opening up in order to incorporate people who were not invited or accepted within uh, academic spaces. I believe it's important to reflect on the current uh, context uh, in the pandemic, the way the inequalities uh, are now stronger than ever, which are the lives that uh, matter and which lives doesn't matter. I think this is a, a more relevant subject that appears over and over on a daily basis. So I want to thank to have the opportunity to have a dialogue with uh, all of you, colleagues, friends, and uh, an audience. In the spirit of the studies uh, of disability, 
we made or we tried to make this event accessible. So if you want to share the links, uh, please, uh, you can have access to it now or, or, or later. So thanks for being with us. I hope you enjoy the colloquium and to and that it can become a, a good opportunity to continue with our reflections on this complex yet important subjects. Thank you. So considering the time framework, I am going to give floor. Well, I'm going to start the first panel and it's a pleasure for me to present our first uh, speakers, Laura Chazaro and Ariana Acevedo both from the research department of Simvestad in Mexico City. I'm going to read uh, Laura Chazaro. She's a, a researcher from the uh, Institute, of, uh, the Polytechnic Institute in Mexico in educational, in the education department. Her main research is history of sciences and uh, material history of medicine, science, and statistical thinking, uh, measuring of bodies and quantification of the population. Among her publications, we can include, include uh, anatomical collection to National Museum, uh, 1895, uh, skulls and female pelvises, and uh, this article appeared in a book edited by Paula Lopez and Ariadna Acevedo that appeared in 2018. And Dr. Ariana Acevedo, she's a researcher on the Department of Education area and advanced studies in Mexico City. Her re most recent pro collective project was published in 2018, and it's called Beyond Authority, Destabilizing, uh, uh, and it was co-edited with Paola Lopez Caballero. And this is a project, a book that examines the role of racism and uh, authority on historiography and sciences to study the population, the indigenous people. So it's a pleasure for me uh, talking to you. Thanks for being here. And I will now give floor to, to you, to Laura Chazaro and Ariadna Acevedo. Susan, can we have a, a moment to say something before uh, showing the video? I think you can, so go ahead. Yerma will start the video, but uh, please be my guest. Thank you. Well, we just wanted to point out that, well, since Laura comes from the area of uh, natural story and I myself from education, one of our interests um, in understanding uh, intelligence is understanding how the laboratory of the sciences has a communication with the with the students and that's our main concern and how in this communication we will see different forms of of racialization and authority uh, that interests us uh, when it comes to uh, moving forward or not. So just to give that small context, but we hope that the uh, presentation is self-explicative. Good morning. I'm going to read the paper, Measuring Mexican Minds, Intelligence, Delay and Race, in tests applied to students, 1890 to 1930. The authors, Ariadna Acevedo and I, want to thank Susan Antibi for organizing the event and for inviting us. I'm going to read the first part of this talk and Ariadna Acevedo will continue. One of the bases of medicine is to measure, to quantify how close or far bodies are from pathological states. 
These measurement practices implied the creation of precision instruments, which over time became central to medical practice to sound out and diagnose, and from there to develop some remedies. In fact, many theoretical discussions of medicine were intended to be resolved by measuring or creating measurement standards. In this context, modern medicine cultivated anthropometry. They sought to determine to what extent bodily differences were racial or sexual and whether they predisposed or caused deviations or pathologies. In these various senses, infantile or non-infantile bodies were the object of measurement. In Mexico, at the end of the 19th century, the government of Porfirio Diaz promoted projects to measure and quantify multiple manifestations of life, including the territory, plants, and animals. The school setting was included in these projects with the Educational Hygienic Congress of 1882 and Medical Inspection in Mexico City, established in 1896. Around 1907, in the organizational work of the Ministry of Public Instruction and Fine Arts, medical forms were created to measure the bodies of children and adolescents. The works of doctors such as Daniel Vergara Lope and Uribe Troncoso, and later those of Rafael Santa Marina, stand out. They designed a series of examinations, both in their clinical experiments and in the laboratory of the National Medical Institute, to measure school-aged children. Through Vergara, the Department of Psychopedagogy of the Ministry of Public Instruction and Fine Arts requested the National Medical Institute to evaluate and measure the health of teachers and students. These government-sponsored medical interventions aimed to monitor and control the school population. The interesting thing is that those actions carried out between the laboratories and the schools were materialized in tests and a series of forms or records, hybrid products of the classroom and the laboratory. In principle, Vergara was tasked with determining whether teachers and students were healthy, free of infectious diseases, with knowing the hygienic conditions of the schools, such as architecture and furniture. In general, with measuring the physical and mental state of the students. This is one of the examples of a colleague of Vergara's who is measuring and making anthropometric measurements. Here he is drawing blood from the children. Without yet being very clear on what the tests invented in the laboratories were looking for in their application to the school setting, they generated data such as height, weight, muscle strength, and the respiratory, auditory, and ocular capacity of the students. For example, this is an anthropometric medical form for the pupil created at the National Medical Institute. These data were beginning to be associated with the ability to learn but they were not concerned with mental health in the intelligence tests, but with health in general and race as an expression of the national. The measurements carried out in the National Medical Institute that began in 1911 at the request of the Ministry of Public Instruction adopted the anthropometric model of the type that combined Broca, Mosso, and Lombroso, drawing timid conclusions about the mind and intelligence of the child. Looking at the red box, some conclusions are drawn that are not related to the measurements of, of the body that they have taken from that child. Very poor intelligence, bad temper, capricious. These are generalizations. It was during those years that other colleagues of Vergara, upon seeing his work, determined that it was unfeasible and useless to refer to the psyche as it was complex and difficult. Historiography has not examined this evidence of resistance and opposition, such as that faced by Vergara Lopez tests from the laboratory of the National Medical Institute and the Department of Psychopedagogy. One of our hypotheses is that there was not yet a group of professionals sufficiently specialized in psychology who sought to legitimize their practice as there already was in the United States at the time, and Mexico lacked conditions that would favor the creation of an industry for the production and generalized application of psychometric tests for all school children in the country. Those who made decisions about the research that was carried out and those who rejected the psychic examinations were the doctors. 
they did not need to legitimize themselves. It would be later that they began to practice measuring minds, which included measuring the capacities of children and young people, their intelligence. That is why it is worth asking how the measurement of the mind and intelligence came to be, how a space was created for testing practices, uh, for examining schools. While doctors already created individual health cards, like this one that I'm showing you, noting the results of the tests that were generally performed in the laboratories, the teachers recorded the results of generally public and oral tests in group lists, not in individual documents for each student. Note that here the card is intended for a specific student and his own growth over time. The experience of intelligence tests deserves attention because it allows us to trace an already relatively established medical discourse and an incipient psychological discourse in the histories of schools of, of childhood and youth, which are measured, classified, and valued in them, and the racialization of social problems. So this invites us to ask ourselves how the laboratory tests that determine certain pathologies became tests of children and schools. How and for what purpose was the measuring of the mind or the intelligence pursued? To appreciate what it meant to introduce intelligence tests into the classroom, it is important to consider the intimate relationship between school exams and the introduction of the graded school. The hypothesis we want to explore is that the passage of doctors through the schools of Mexico City, including their production of individualized health cards and later their intelligence tests, was one of the factors that favored the individualization of both medical and academic records. We see this as part of the process of the production of the pupil as subject and of a process of growth, specialization, and rationalization of the educational system, legitimized by the scientific nature of medical examinations and psychometric tests. That's the end of my contribution. Thank you. Here I continue. In the 19th century, school exams were public and oral and sought to demonstrate the teacher's suitability to parents and authorities. It was only in the first decades of the 20th century that public exams were slowly replaced by written exams in the classroom and with the sole presence of teachers and students. Here, the emphasis was on children's learning. At the same time, the introduction of the graded school took place, that is, a school organized by a hierarchy of grades of a level and an age that is presumed homogenous together with so-called simultaneous or frontal teaching. This put an end to the previous organization in which students of various ages did individual work, each following their own pace in different subjects, and the teacher attended to them one by one. With the new simultaneous frontal teaching, the teacher taught a whole group at the same time. So this was seen as requiring a group with a homogeneous level in all subjects and ideally at the same age. Thus, a hierarchy by grade was produced that sought to achieve the highest possible efficiency in teaching through classification and homogenization, and that assumed linear and uninterrupted school trajectories, where the ladder of school grades perfectly corresponded to the ladder of ages. With this more regulated and rigid classification, the passing and failing of grades became crucial milestones. It is here that the new idea of school delay or retardation appears. If before delay was understood simply to be a lack of punctuality in the student, by the 1920s delay refers to the student who fails an exam or who fails a school year, therefore having to repeat it instead of advancing to the next grade. The graded school 
was introduced in the 1890s, but took shape in the 1920s, which is also when intelligence tests and what was called secondary education, which was the intermediate level between elementary and higher education, were introduced. Secondary education was new at this time and was designed especially for adolescents, a new age category on which psychologists debated and that implied a reorganization of the whole system. Well, now we are going to go on to the intelligence tests or mental tests, as they were called at the time, which were applied in a very particular institution that was the House of the Indigenous Student. I wanted to show you this photograph. I'm going to read the caption to you. It says, Wichal Indian with his son upon arrival at the House of the Indigenous Student. This photograph is taken from a book that has the title of this boarding school, The House of the Indigenous Student, and its subtitle is 16 Months of Work in a Collective Psychological Experiment with Indians. The book is from 1927. What does this House of the Indigenous Student allow us to see? Well, it allows us to see the tensions generated by the objectives of intelligence tests, as well as the difficulty of separating the test, a supposedly neutral tool, from racialized economic and social conditions. The house was a boarding school designed for male speakers of indigenous languages from different regions of the country to receive a basic and secondary education in Mexico City. Its main objective was to educate young people who in turn would return to their communities to educate them and thus end the evolutionary backwardness that, according to the educational authorities, separated the indigenous people from the modern era. The school opened in 1926 and closed permanently in 1933 because most of the students decided to stay in the city. The Ministry of Education concluded that it should only open this type of school in the indigenous regions themselves, since its objective was not to achieve, quote, individual rehabilitation of the indigenous people, but the rehabilitation of entire communities. Faced with the failure of this community objective, the House's reports and propaganda underscored a second objective to demonstrate that indigenous youth were as intelligent as those in the city and therefore as deserving of education and opportunities as they were. In an effort to demonstrate equal capabilities, intelligence tests were attractive to educators And I'm going to continue so that you can enjoy the following photograph. This is a boarding school student, and this is one of those classic boarding school photos for native inhabitants of the Americas, in which they show a before and an after. I don't have time to talk about the aesthetics of these photographs, but I leave them there for you to enjoy. I will also read the caption to show the level of individualization and personalization that attending the school suggested. According to the educational authorities that organized this institution in this image, instead of talking about a Wichal Indian in the abstract, they are already personalizing with a name and surname of the young man. And it says, Carrillo de la Cruz, 16 years old, Huichol Tamarito Mesquitic, Jalisco, which is the town and state from where the boy came. It says, eight months after admission, because the text of the book is trying to show a radical change. This for them is the representation of evolutionary backwardness as they described it, and this is the young man rehabilitated for modernity. But I will continue with the story of the tests. 
As is well known, after the test created by Albert Alfred Binet in France to diagnose mental retardation, psychologists in the United States took up their method of comparing chronological age with mental age and adapted it into a test that could be applied to all students in any school. With this, the graded school made room for intelligence tests, first in the United States and then much more timidly in Mexico. They appear with a promise of offering an efficient and scientific technique to form and classify groups of students that would be as homogenous as possible for each grade. For example, both the FEI and the Beta and Otis tests were applied in the Caus of the Indigenous Student in Mexico City. Each group was evaluated, producing a classification in which approximately 50% formed the central or regular group, 25% were the bottom group, and 25% were the top group. Although the definition of intelligence was debated, the test tended to emphasize a capacity or ability for judgment that could include memory, imagination, and other skills, but sought to distinguish itself from learning and school practice. In practice, the distinction with school learning proved very difficult to establish. This is evidenced in the observations and conclusions that the experts drew after applying the tests. Our hypothesis is that the application of these tests at the house of the indigenous student showed their enormous dependence on school learning. And I'm going to change my image so that you can see an example of the things that were measured. The fragility of these tests as instruments for measuring intelligence or any other mental capacity separated from its social and cultural context must be made clear. The specialists resisted expressing their reservations about these tests. Montana Lucia Hastings, a disciple of Columbia University psychologist Edward Thorndike, was interested in exploring the hypothesis that the lower scores of Mexicans in San Diego, California, were largely due to their lack of English proficiency. At the house of the indigenous student in Mexico City, this same graduate student Hastings continued to explore the language issue with students who spoke indigenous languages and were unfamiliar with Spanish, with little or no schooling, and who did not yet know how to read and write, having, for example, difficulty holding a pencil and drawing with it. Various social and cultural aspects, some perceived by specialists and others not, revealed the difficulty of designing neutral tests. With the consent of Fay in France, the Fay test, the, the truth is, I don't know how to pronounce it in French, but it is written F-A-Y, recognized the cultural difference for which it was not appropriate to give fewer points to Mexican children who failed to draw an umbrella after receiving the instruction to draw a woman or some people walking on a rainy day. The images I have displayed here are in fact from an original French book by Fay. And there are several examples of how children, in this case, the drawing on the right is by a seven-year-old boy, draw an umbrella. The children, depending on how they draw the objects, in this case, this one, and the people, according to the details and various other characteristics of their drawings, obtain different scores. Well, in short, with Mexican children, it was seen that it was not common to draw umbrellas but other ways of covering themselves from the rain. And they realized that there was a cultural difference that had to be recognized. However, the same students were asked to draw a spoon as one of the tests, despite the fact that in many regions of Mexico, the tortilla was mainly used to take food from the plate to the mouth 
instead of cutlery, for example. However, for Mexican doctors and pedagogues, the tests were loaded with a strong scientific legitimacy, backed by the prestige of French research and American universities, which prevented them from rejecting them openly. I'm going to show you now. Well, what is the materiality that builds this scientific legitimacy? For that, I need to go to my next slide. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to make my circle tiny so you can see the PowerPoint better. I lost my PowerPoint. Where was it? Here it is. Apologies. Good. What do I want to ask now to conclude our presentation? What were these so-called mental tests doing with the idea of retardation that I have already spoken about in relation to the school concept of delay or retardation? But now we also want to see what happens to the highly racialized concept of developmental backwardness and what happens with the idea of delay in intelligence tests. And what about race too? Well, to function, tests require standardizations and at the same time produce standardized subjects. In 1926 to 27, however, when these tests were applied in the boarding school for indigenous people, the tests had not yet been standardized for the Mexican context. That is, they had not been applied to a sufficient number of children in Mexico City to obtain representative data of the city, not to mention the nation. Even so, from the discussions, it can be deduced that those involved eventually sought to use the averages of children in the country's capital as a yardstick to measure the rest of Mexican children. With that numerical operation, the children of the city became the standard of the nation. Furthermore, in the specific case of the House of the Indigenous Student, as it was a boys-only school, no data would be obtained for Indigenous girls. Despite this absence, the masculine was universalized for the entire indigenous population, using the test to affirm that the Indians in general, supposedly universal, were part of the Mexican nation and that they were as, an, as intelligent as the rest. The educational authorities spoke of incorporation of indigenous people into the nation, and such incorporation was not only educational, but also racial. From 1922, the censuses eliminated racial classifications. With that, the implicit message of the General Directorate of Statistics was that in Mexico, the mestizos dominated and that racial homogenization had arrived. With the use of tests and quantification, specialists sought to define the average Mexican child and new subjectivities were produced. Mexicans, Indian or not, on average, were healthy, intelligent, and capable of governing themselves. Those who were outside of that average would be marked by the specter of backwardness. Although the doctors and pedagogues who applied the tests sought to demonstrate that the backwardness was academic, or socioeconomic and not mental disability, the temporal hierarchy implied by the term backwardness was perpetuated. They continued to take for granted that the indigenous population lived in so-called evolutionary backwardness and that it was necessary to educate them to leave this backwardness behind them, or rather to save them from this backwardness. In this way, the tests, while demonstrating that even indigenous Mexicans were intelligent, solidified the hierarchies that sought to define delay as slowness of learning, also as being stuck in the past, and as an incorporated sign that is as body and as race. 
Finally, despite the elusiveness of the objectives of measurement, the tests produce classifying hierarchies of individuals and groups invested with scientific legitimacy and with lasting effects, both in classrooms and among doctors and their laboratories. What we have here is the Laboratory of Experimental Psychology at the National School of Higher Studies in 1926. And with this, I say goodbye. We will be happy to answer your questions in real time. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to Ariadna and Lau Laura for this uh, amazing presentations. Well, this collaborative presentation with so many interesting ideas to continue this exploration. I don't know if the uh, if the audience has uh, questions or ideas. Thinking about this concept of uh, the lab, going to, from the lab to the to the classroom, and how the classroom is somehow also a, a, a laboratory. So I think it's interesting how a race comes in. Uh, this is something that has been debated by many uh, scholars. And at to which point or to what extent race is still a relevant element for these uh, circumstances. This, I think this will be a, a question on my behalf. Something that I wanted to ask both of the presenters is this idea of the movement between the collective or, I mean, the whole group, the school group, towards a more individualized process where the school subject occurs. I think it's interesting if we consider at the same time uh, the way it works for indigenous people or the idea that was held on uh, regarding indigenous groups. It has been a vision, a collective vision of the people. It was not a matter of rehabilitating the individual it was a matter of making the indigenous people to go back to its community because the community was thought as a whole, a group. So this is uh, uh, maybe a, a, a difference between the vision of community uh, uh, in terms of indigenous people, or maybe how different it is from the urban subject in this progression from the beginning of the 20th century. There is also a question, a YouTube question. I don't know if you're listening to me correctly. Okay, I'm going to read the question. Perdón. Okay. Voy a leer esta pregunta. Eh, muy interesante. Eso viene de Marco Calderón. Muy interesante. It's a question from Marco Calderón. Uh, very interesting presentation. I would like to know if in your research uh, about 
uh, well, about this subject, have you find uh, maybe apathy is derived uh, from this uh, sickness? And another question, uh, are there legal dispositions that uh, oblige the application or their uh, intelligence exams? I don't know, Ariadna or Laura, if you would like to answer the question. Okay, I'm going to answer the most technical and specific questions. I'm going to, to cheat. I'm going to leave the most complicated to, to Laura, to Laura, up to which point race is uh, still important because it's like a, like a, like a phantom element. We have to emphasize uh, socioeconomical contexts, but at the same time, it's still present in the language. But well, I think uh, Laura can uh, elaborate more precisely on that matter. On the technical issues regarding school, Moving from group collectivity to individual uh, uh, person, when we talk about a rehab or group rehabilitation, I think that when we talk about uh, in school uh, techniques, they are moving towards individualization, but the project or the educational project in Mexico from the revolution, from the 1920s, for the people, uh, uh, including indigenous people, people from, from who work the, the land. It's focused towards what it's called general or community rehab. So from my point of view, there is not a a philosophical or a theoretical basis for this. There's just a pragmatism of, well, we don't have money to have uh, 80,000 uh, uh, students, so we cannot uh, rehabilitate everybody. So we're just going to work on, on an elite. Uh, at, at the beginning, it was not so clear who should be, but it was like, well, let's choose and lead of teachers on communities, uh, communities that were already civilized, and they are going to uh, civilize or rehabilitate the, the, their communities as an extension. So what I mean with uh, individual uh, school or techniques, I think that doctors, have a very specific way of naming. But teachers, uh, we, we do not speak at that level of individualization. So so when we talk about these techniques, this is not a project, a very a quite aware project. Uh, from the from a point of view, not from the point of view of teachers, but from uh, from doctors or uh, you know medical workers, the director of the indigenous student. When we talk about avulia and apathy as uh, as illnesses, uh, we didn't find any other references. But he's taking a, a language, uh, like medical language to put across the, the idea. Maybe uh, uh, Laura has found something more about avulia and apathy. And the question about uh, exams of uh, or intelligence uh, quizzes, uh, they were not uh, mandatory. We know very little about them. There's very little research. And our research is still uh, on the go. The evidence that we have is that uh, in Mexico City, in some capitals of the states, uh, they conducted some uh, intelligence quizzes, but not outside big cities. 
So the data that we with which we've been working come exclusively from from the city, from Mexico City, and they were not mandatory. Uh, this uh, intelligence quizzes were used in an experimental way. So they were used for classifying uh, the normal people and retarded people. This is a, a subject we haven't talked about because we were more interested in not what happened with that minority of retarded people, but what happened with the rest and how these intelligence quizzes have to do with the foundation of the education system in Mexico. It could be associated to the minorities of those who are labeled as retarded. And I think that with the concept, uh, this concept, it extends to the children in different schools and, this, um, and the idea of improving uh, the, the population. So that's why these quizzes were important, but they were not mandatory. They were not uh, applied in a, in a big or, or way. So it's not as as generalized as in the United States in, in the United States. So I leave here my response and I give the floor to, to Laura. Thank you, Susan. The first question I was with the open YouTube, but I'm sorry. I was like like the children uh <laughs> in primary school. Uh, no, the idea of racism that Susan was mentioning, or just to go back to it very briefly. If you could repeat that question, please. Well, it's a general question because Race is a subject that has been studied for so long uh, in the area of health, but also at schools. But I think that there are some currents that tend to believe that race is not such an important category. And I'm not sure in which part of the presentation, but it was mentioned that uh, you abandoned this category of race, or, or, or that they, the researchers abandoned the category of race around 1922. So it's interesting to think uh, how to emphasize or how do we not emphasize race as a category? So that was a little bit my, my question. It was a general question. Do you still believe that race is in the in the center of all of this uh, quiz or test dynamics? Or if you have found arguments that say, you know, race is no longer relevant because they were all like a mixed, like a mix. So how have you been thinking about this problem uh, or this topic about race as something definite or something that appears uh, sometimes, but not all the time? I think your question is interesting. And for us, Maybe the only answer we can give is uh, an answer from experiment, from our experiments. It was, of course, uh, a, a, a topic in 1922. Talking about race was uh, was already old, and according to the interpretation, it came from the intervention of the French that unleashes in the practice things that. Uh, the doctors wanted to measure. And race, from a medical point of view, has a dark wing within it uh, when it, it comes to evolution. All of this uh, creates so many ways of talking about race, and especially one that has prevailed is uh, uh, parametry. So all these uh, parameters, all these policies that intended to be so precise, measuring the body, uh, they had a lot of tools, a lot of instruments to measure, uh, you know, respiration or breathing and various elements from the body. So measuring intelligence, not race, but intelligence, 
because the focus was we, they needed to differentiate the Yaquis, the Mayan, uh, the modern May Mayans, and those who were mixed. So they all they wanted to make a difference, but based on measures. But behind this, there was an idea of political uh, incapabilities. Unca they were incapable of uh, governing themselves. So when we uh, started to come close to the revolution, uh, the doctors during the, the during the government of Porfirio Diaz, they were wondering about the the capabilities, like the children who were uh, disabled. It was like saying that Mexicans were condemned or deemed to. Uh, political incapabilities because uh, they came from indigenous people. So during uh, Porfirio Diaz's uh, uh, government, Justo Sierra uh, said that we should not insist on, on, on those uh, measurements. There was a population that was, it was, it was possible to educate this population. Yes, there were idiots. Yes, there were stupid people. Okay, yes, but but the point that was not the point. If we continue with this line of uh, of this argument, it was opening the possibility of saving these children, saving these populations that may not be that smart, but still uh, they were going to try to save them. So along with. Uh, with those characteristics, race is in the body. It's a, it's a mark, like a birthmark. But what Ariadne mentioned, when the children arrived with their uh, typical garments, that is a way of redeeming. Race doesn't go away. The, the child is still Jackie King, that came from, uh, I don't know, somewhere. But it's uh, they tried to integrate him not only into the school, but also as part of a nation. So the speech changed. Like I st studied in the laboratories. And if you, we keep thinking this question, but you only check the research, the experiments made or conducted before the revolution and after the revolution, race doesn't disappear. It becomes a microscopic element. It becomes uh, cells, but it doesn't go away. Yet it has another expression. So here, uh, intelligence is uh, uh, it's racial. And it's applied to children who were phenotypically and gen genetically as, um, as mixed, but they are still considered indigenous. What uh, Marco asked about avulia or apathy, this was studied mainly in males or at least uh, uh, according to the case that we took from Casa del Niño Indígena or the House for Indigenous Children, these studies on women who are like bodies without any soul, without any intelligence, they are chlorotic or anemic, and they are labeled that way because they don't want to eat. And I think this corresponds to a avulia, like not wanting to eat, being lazy, being apathetic, these characteristics that are uh, attributed to indigenous people in general. Thanks, Laura. I have some, uh, we have some other questions on, on the chat. We will start with that of Jesus Perez Gaona. Is it possible from the 1920s to link aporophobia as a way of racism to use divisive practices as political practices? I can continue. 
reading questions. There is a more specific question that it's for uh, Ariadna. My question is for Ariadna. I am. I mean, it's interesting for me the use of the word rehab or rehabilitation. Like, I want to understand what it really means. I don't know if you would like to ask. Well, with uh, Jesus Perez Garna, uh, in any case, uh, talking about uh, agoraphobia, uh, I don't know if you know a little bit more about it, uh, Jesus Perez Garna, but if you know more, it would be interesting if you could share more, more material. I don't know too much about it. Uh, regarding rehab or rehabilitation, it's a word or a, or a concept that was used within this uh, context. And it frequently appears in a book that was published, which is like a, like a propaganda from this house for the children. And rehabilitation appears, it's a word that appears, but it, it's never explained. In the context of this book, that has a subtitle of a psychological experiment with indigenous people. So I interpret this word as a medical term that are getting into the language of teachers, particularly Enrique Corona, who is maybe the one who wrote the most part of, of the book. But we believe that most of what is written there comes from Enrique Corona, who was a, a, a quite important uh, character in terms of indigenous education. But that, of course, they, they don't justify the use of the term. They just connect it with uh, the lack of evolution. So there's no big science behind it. But what it's supposedly what it does is to uh, understand this uh, slowdown in evolution or the apparent slowdown regarding indigenous people. I wanted to go back to the question of Susan because now that she made it a little longer, I found it quite interesting when she asked us, what happens with, with the race? I mean, it is it there? Others say it's not important. I believe that what the interpretations made by doctors as well as teachers is that this uh, intelligence quizzes um, is that race is, is there. It's present. So when the census say, oh, we don't need to to consider race uh, uh, because we are all mestizo. Uh, but when we talk about uh, Mexican children, there's also a, a, a racial uh, label. It's important to say this because the speech of the ideology of the mestizos during the 20th century tells us that since we are so concerned with the cultural context and socioeconomical context, then we're not racist. And this is the moment when this uh, discourse starts to, to emerge. And there's a lot of tension. Uh, they were like, oh yeah, Mexican children uh, would not draw uh, umbrellas because they use hats. So they apparently were not racist. However, although they criticize the intelligence quizzes, they still adapt these elements and they remain racist, but in other, in other moments, they don't realize how these quizzes are not neutral. And the implicit uh, subject is that, well, Mexicans are supposed to be just as smart as any white kid, or, or that was the idea. But the interpretation of the intelligence quizzes are so ambiguous that it's not really clear. Like, it's not clear if race really matters or if it doesn't. It, 
and well, that's part of our exploration. Eh, bueno, eh, solamente quisiera decir que, um, por ejemplo, esto del síndrome de falta de atención. Uh, regarding the syndrome of TDH, eh, like this syndrome really exists or it's an invention. Well, we cannot answer this question, at least not from a point of view of our research, but what I can tell you is that intelligence tests measure uh, the capability of someone of memorizing. I mean, for me, it's interesting how the existence of certain tools, such as intelligence tests, or other medical tool, it opens or they open a space of legitimate practices, of the so-called legitimate practices, and they uh, and they open the possibility of uh, the invention of other elements such as uh, TDH for instance. But there are other scholars who have demonstrated that there was a space uh, within the, the, the practices, like a legitimate, like a legitimate legitimation of practices, because the tests, what they do is to measure the kid, and that's the point, measure the kid. Instead, what we have seen before uh, intelligence tests existed, professors wouldn't measure the, the kid. They were measuring like the whole group. They, they wouldn't give a, uh, an individual grade. They will give a grade for the whole group. I think this is an, an, an interesting element to say that then again, racism doesn't disappear even if I say that all Mexicans and all mestizo are fairly intelligent, it's important to remember that the reason that the racism never went away. So they created tests, tools in order to define and to measure differences based on racial uh, characteristics, although they're not named that way, but they are called a phenotypical or genetical. Nowadays, we can talk about how an idea, uh, the human uh, genome that brings us all together as humans, well, there are still a lot of people looking for differences, like the Mexican genome. So this racial thing is still present. I actually had another question, maybe a, a, a quick question for both of you, because it's something I, I find interesting. I saw that in your research, you were focused on public education. This idea of the of the average kid. But there are other spaces, there are other institutional spaces like in Mexico City, uh, hospices or uh, public hospitals where these tests are, are being applied. So I don't know if in your researches you have find any dialogue between these uh, institutions or how can we find this relevance in the educational spaces for average people and also for, for marginalized people? That's actually a good question. We haven't made an, an investigation specifically on that matter, but uh, there is a, a research between uh, intelligence tests 
when it came to uh, analyzing criminal children. When it when they wanted to well to, to frame some 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 children, so the, the pedagogy was also present. They wanted to analyze children who were sick, maybe with certain uh, certain illnesses, and the aim was. Uh, selecting them in order to take them away from school. That's kind of things we can uh, connect with uh, some practices like the, in, the like investigations that were made in La Castañeda. If we take this as a vector between uh, race and intelligence, it was also present in other spaces within the judicial and criminal system. Children were prosecuted. Like there were many kinds of children who were outside, outside the schools or they were either they were separated or they were uh, chased to uh, bring them into the schools. So the intelligence tests were used for this uh, purpose. Thank you. So, well, I think it's it's important. And this, it's so complicated to make uh, research on all this wide range of institutions. But for me, it's interesting to check all the links or the, or the bonds between them. I don't know if there are other questions. I think there aren't. So we have four minutes. So if there's any final comment or final conclusion before the pause, I don't know. Uh, technicality. In YouTube, there are making questions and I don't know if it was something that you took into consideration because I was checking out Facebook and, and YouTube. I mean, the questions repeated and others were not shared. Well, like the question about the House of Indigenous Children has any relationship with Vasconcelos. No, Vasconcelos just criticized that school because he thought it was a, a big mistake to the segregation of Indigenous Children. Thank you, Ariane. I think all the questions appeared in our in our chat. So yes, it's it's an important character, an important person in this discussion, although not uh, the way it was presented. Or at, or at least not in this specific context. So I think we have run out of time. So I just wanted to thank uh, Ariadna and Laura Chasero for your presentation and the opportunity of knowing a little bit more about what you are, about your work. So thank everybody. I hope to see you all in about 15 minutes. We're going to have our next our next panel of this colloquium. Thank you so much. Yeah.